Hi, ladies and gentlemen, Terry Martin with the Illinois Channel, and I'm joined with Jeff Berkowitz in Chicago. And Jeff, it has been a historic week, an amazing news week and a historic week with a number of Supreme Court cases coming down. And of course, as we tape this on July the 1st, Monday, just last Thursday, we had the first presidential debate, the earliest presidential debate, really, since they started having presidential debates over the last 60 years or so. And uh, it was widely claimed, as I'm sure all of our viewers know, that Joe Biden had a disastrous uh, performance. We will be talking a bit about that and the fallout in a minute. But more history made today because we had, as we taped this on the 1st of July, the Supreme Court in their last session issued a presidential immunity case. It has been called presumptive immunity. Jeff uh, is a lawyer or has a legal background. And Jeff, why don't you give us your analysis of what the court ruled and what it means? Right. Our heading for the show says presidents have immunity. That's a bit misleading. Presidents have presumptive immunity. And that's an important word because it, the deal is when presidents act, they can be acting either in their official capacity as president or in a private action. Private actions, unofficial actions have no immunity, folks. But actions taken in their official capacity have, you could say, unlimited immunity. So that's what people have, that's what the courts will have to ultimately decide in the case before us. And we should remind people, this is not just about Trump. As people have said, this is a ruling for the ages. It's a little shocking that we got 250 years or almost 250 years without having the Supreme Court weigh in on this, but they hadn't. But the point is, this is not just for Trump. Other presidents will have similar issues in presumably in the future, and now we have a Supreme Court ruling on this matter that tells us which actions Yeah, it gets some clarity. I would say it was presumed, and why we didn't have it before, it was presumed immunity uh, that presidents couldn't be sued. Congress has immunity, uh, you know, so that in the course of your official duties, you could not be sued or all of a sudden, uh, our legal, our, our governmental process would come to a halt if there was not some sort of immunity. Now, that was the presumption, and I think that's why we went 250-some years to this point. Now, what triggered this? What triggered this is the Justice Department under Merrick Garland appointed Jack Smith, a known bulldog of a prosecutor, to claim and and launch a prosecution of Donald Trump and saying that he, uh, in trying to challenge the outcome of the election uh, on January the 6th, that he was uh, breaking the law. And so the question, and you, you can correct me if you got, if I'm getting this wrong, but that uh, the presumption, or Smith triggered this, and so the court had to rule to the contention by Trump's lawyers that he had immunity as president from prosecution. And so they issued this decision today. Let's, uh, well, this uh, Jerry, before, again, again, I'm going I'm to play this, a clip, but go ahead and give us your take okay. of what I just said. Well, again, you just, you just said presidents have immunity. You need to start. Well, they do have the on their official they have limited, excuse, excuse me. They have limited immunity. You need to, when you discuss this. All right, well, let's, to, let's, let's take that limited. apart for a minute. Hang on. Okay. Go I on. think you're, you're confusing people. Are you saying they have limited immunity when they are acting in their official capacity? No, but the point right, is. Right, right, stop. Right, no. <laughs> Presidents have immunity as long as they are acting in their official capacity as president. Now you said it correctly. The limited, well, I'm just clarifying because I think you were stirring the, the waters here. The limited aspect is that it's limited only to their official acts. And so the question is, was President Trump acting in his official capacity when he was trying to challenge the results of the uh, certification of the election? 
Let's listen to what Jonathan Turley of George Washington Law School had to say today. The indictment's allegations that Trump attempted to pressure the vice president to take particular acts in connection with his role with the certification proceeding uh, thus involve official conduct. And Trump is at least presumptively immune uh, from prosecution for such conduct. Here, the court is, is imposing a very significant burden on Jack Smith. Uh, but the court here is giving much more clear lines than some people expected. Uh, they're saying that there is a presumption here that you have to deal with. The burden is high. And the court indicates that it may view this as something that could hinder uh, a president's authority. So the important point here is the effect of this ruling is to send this case back to, uh, to Tanya Chutkin, the federal district court judge, and she will start the ball rolling, briefs and otherwise, so they can hash out at the so-called trial court level the facts that is that will help somebody decide, presumably, I guess, a jury, whether there's a violation here because the fact the determination has to be made are the actions that jack smith special counsel is talking about are they official acts and then the legal determination if the jury makes that determination would be that if they're official president trump has immunity as to those actions. And then that would put that that's, would put the kibosh on the prosecution by Jack Smith. But once that's decided, there'd be an opportunity to appeal and it would go back to the appellate court and it would then go to the to the Supreme Court. So right. that will not happen prior to November five. So this is a big win today for President Trump, no matter how it ultimately comes out. And that's in the larger context, not for us and the viewers to get lost in the minutia of this case, but in the broader context, I think we've laid it out that the president, okay. they, mm -hmm. they, they clarified the Supreme court clarified the question of our presidents. Do they have immunity when they are acting in their official capacity? And then the question is, was this, or was this not part of his official capacity? It seemed like the Supreme court, as I understand it, uh, seem to say that Trump was within the boundaries of his official capacity when he was doing No, they didn't doing. say that. You're wrong. That's what we determined factually. That's a factual determination that will occur in the trial court. Yeah, so that's the so this court, is where it goes I, down back to the lower court to be right, determined on that question. Was Trump acting in his official capacity? That's that. That's the point. And um, so you got you, you have to just keep that in mind. They get, and the other thing to say here, this was not a unanimous decision. Chief Judge Chief Justice Roberts on important matters likes to haggle and see if he can modify things to get a 9-0 decision. Remember, we've had some 9-0 decisions here. What, what was, was today's not, count? It was 6-3 along the ideological lines of the six so-called more conservative justices voting as we've just you know described. how just justice jackson voted on this was she yeah she was one of the three and on the dissent because she side. and i brought up because yeah. she joined the majority uh, earlier the conservative majority right earlier. no but this this was a complete sometimes it's five four so sometimes they've lost chief justice roberts the conservative side right. this time he was voting with the other conservatives so-called conservatives that was six the three the three more liberal justices elena, elena kagan uh justice sotomayor and katanji jackson katanji brown jackson all were on the dissenting side so it's it's not a nine oh vote and, and some people and, and in fact the dissents were somewhat harsh and perhaps a little less respectful but we'll talk more about that but the key thing is the supreme court has ruled this is going to go back to the district so what, court, and and we can go on and maybe talk about the key issues here, the fallout from. Yeah, let's. I I, I I don't want to get, but again, yeah. to be clear, and I think we already have made it clear that uh, th this ruling came out today, so neither Jeff or I had time to be reading this and really fully digesting it. So, as much as we can, we wanted to be clarifying what this was about, 
and again, as far as the viewers are concerned, they're not constitutional lawyers. What they want to know, I think, is the impact on the election is it's a win for Trump in that this is going to put the Jack Smith legal case, part of what uh, people have been calling lawfare, an attack uh, by the judiciary on Trump's candidacy. Uh, but this, I think, was the only federal case brought in uh, where these other cases, as the Bragg case and, and others, those were brought at the local level. This was the Justice Department appointing a special prosecutor, Jack Smith. And so, again, it's in the context of the election, it's a win for Trump because this pushes well, Smith past the well, November well, you said election. It's the only, you said it was the only federal case. That's not correct. Jack Smith also filed the classified documents case in Florida. That's a federal case. Right, right. So those two are, and, and just one thing to add, a long time ago, when you and I were discussing these cases in general, I said, I thought a lot of these cases, certainly this case, involves what I call the First Amendment. And I believe, I haven't studied the opinion yet, but I think they did say that. That is, this is a First Amendment issue. The President of the United States is not below the law. We all are protected by the First Amendment. When the President has discussions with his Vice President, and he's not engaged in fraud, and certainly portions of these were clearly not fraud. They were clearly official acts. He can talk to the vice to president. He can call up the state legislators. He can have these discussions. This is what we call politics. I, I'll just say one other thing. About uh, 1965 or so, up until that point, the U.S. Supreme Court did not get into what they called political questions. That changed with Baker v. Carr, and they got into apportionment. And all hell has broken loose, loose over the last 60 years or so. Because now they're into politics, okay? Like it or not, they are. And this is a big change that happened 60 years ago. And this is why the Supreme Court was wise to avoid it all those years. Because but I also we're think the political landscape post-Nixon impeachment effort by the Democrats, you know, back in 1973, 74 right. area, that changed the landscape, and we've been in this hyper-partisan period of time ever since. And then there was the impeachment effort against Clinton. Now we have the impeachment right. effort against Biden. I mean, we're in a different era. I think the Supreme Court had to kind of clarify this, especially as we're coming up in the election here. Oh, of course, of course. They had to They had to rule here. They had to step in. In fact, I thought it would have been better if they could have done this earlier. They didn't. They, maybe they didn't have the opportunity. But let's go on because we want to cut. We want to get to the big issue here. Right. The other big issue yep. is, remind people, there was a debate. Uh, we're taping this on July 1. On June 27, major presidential debate, very early relative historically to other presidential debates. And Terry... The world found out what you and I and other people know who've been watching Fox. The President of the United States, Joe Biden, is most likely suffering from, er, from, from dementia. Some form of dementia. I mean, it's obvious. They, if you watch Fox, they don't doctor the video. They show the video undoctored, unedited. And you say, and you say doctor, because the, the, uh, the White House press secretary was uh, claiming that some of these videos were doctored or artificial yeah. intelligence changed. Yeah. It was a lame yeah. excuse that she was making for the president. But we've seen these videos for years now. This shouldn't come as a shock well, to anyone. Clearly, clearly what happened here, just to say it with some brevity, Joe Biden just froze up, and he, he one minute was talking about something else, and 30 seconds later, he was talking about, we killed Medicare. <laughs> and, you know, WTF, what does that mean, to kill Medicare? And you started out talking about taxes being raised on billionaires. It was ludicrous. Clearly, he is not all there. I've said that, you've said that, and, and the Democrats are still delusional, and in denial, there are many, dem certainly left-wing liberals on MSNBC and CNN who are saying, oh, what happened here? We'll have to find out. It was it, it's just a slip. This, you can have a bad night. No, you either have had a stroke, you have some physical disability, 
wake up and smell the coffee. End of end of rant. Well, and so obviously now the question is, uh, among some Democratic circles, there's a division. You have Biden supporters saying you don't kick him off the ticket uh, because he had a bad debate performance. And then you have many others who are saying uh, this is horrible. Not only is he guaranteed to lose, uh, Democrats are saying, uh, but he's going to tear down, uh, as you and I have pointed out, the political fallout could be any number of uh, Democratic House candidates, Democratic Senate candidates could lose their elections as well. And so the Democrats are really facing a very tough issue. And we have uh, from CBS News, we have a poll here that was taken right after the debate, Jeff. And we say this is a poll of Democratic voters, not, not of Republicans, Democratic voters. Should Joe Biden be running for president? And we see that when the poll was taken back in February, 64% of Democrats said, yes, he should. Now it's down to 54%, still a majority, uh, but certainly slippage in the support of the president within his own party. So that's uh, quite an issue. And then let's so, go ahead. Two big, two big things to note here, and we can develop it in more detail. If it happens that Biden is going to stay, well, number one, the choice is up to Biden. He clearly has, in the Democratic convention that's coming up, and um, coming up uh, a July, excuse me, August 19 to August 22 in Chicago. In that well, convention, that's, is that the Democrat or Republican? Democrat. That's what. If I didn't say that, I should say. The Democratic Convention is August 19 to August 22. And clearly, as of this point, Biden has the great majority of the delegates which would anoint him at that point the Democratic nominee. There are almost 4,000, uh, there, there are 4,672 delegates at that Democratic Convention who would be voting, and therefore, you need something like 22,337 to get the nomination. Biden clearly has that, probably has 90% or so of the delegates. So nothing happens. If Biden wants to stay there and barring some move that invokes the 25th Amendment and removes him as president before, then he, he's going to stay there. And, and, and so, but if he steps down, if he says, no, I will relinquish my delegates, well, then all hell breaks loose, and you have what we haven't had since, I think, 1952, when you had a brokered Democratic convention. And Estes Kefauver came out as the nominee, as I recall. I wasn't there. No, the uh, in 52, okay. it was Adlai Stevenson. Okay, uh, yeah. What was Estes? He was the... Estes Kefauver was, uh, the, uh, the, was 1956 for was vice president, okay. and it okay. was either John F. Kennedy as vice president or Estes Kefauver, Estes Kefauver, the senator from Well, anyway, in, 19, in 1952, I guess, is the last time you Democrats had a brokered convention. And the point is, point is here, sorry for my mistake, thanks for the correction. The, the point is, that's what would happen. And then the question is, would they go to somebody like Kamala Harris as vice president? She would be in the mix clearly from the discussion that's going on. Gavin Newsom from California. Maybe they like Gretchen, Gretchen Whit, uh, Whitmer because Michigan is a state at issue. But the point is nobody quite knows at this point. And as I said, and, and it is thought that Jill Biden, a very influential person as the husband, as Joe Biden's wife, is very much against giving up on this. And well, and, and the Bidens got together at Camp David over the weekend. Again, this is Monday right. we're taping this. And we hear reports that uh, the family was against him dropping out, uh, including Hunter Biden being adamant that he should stay on. So to the extent that Joe Biden uh, pays attention to his family, and I'm not sure what he's hearing from those in the Democratic Party, uh, there certainly must be some who want him, as we saw in the polling, to get out. Uh, well, but what's what we're going to? The if, I think. Polling, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think he'll drop out or not? Well, here's the point. It's not up to me and what I think. We'll know. Well, in the I'm, next I'm week curious week, as so. to your reading the tea my, leaves. My, my, my here, yeah, reading the tea leaves within the next week to ten days. 
we're going to start seeping. We're going to start seeing some of these private polls that were done by the Democratic Party and others. And and if they show in these seven or eight uh, swing states or battleground states, which are very close now, although it's likely that Trump has a lead, but several of them at least are very close to the margin of error. If you start getting Trump ahead seven or eight points in these and maybe a five point lead nationally, well, then the Democratic Party, the, the, the Democratic elected officials who are speaking privately and talking about their concern now are going to start pointing to these polls or somebody's going to visit Joe Biden and Dr. Jill Biden and point out these polls. And that would pressure them to say, OK, we'll go ahead and relinquish this. And then that what I just described will be kicked off. That is, is Biden supporting Kamala Harris, supporting anybody else or the other? Who are the what are the other leaders doing in uh, you know, uh, Schumer in the Senate and Hakeem Jeffries in the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi, former speaker. These are the haunch of Barack Obama, Michelle Obama. It's a free for all. And my guess is. Well, my guess is they don't go with Harris because her polling is as low now as Joe Biden's was even before the debate. And, um, you know, so some, but the, the problem they have, they, they created their own problem because so much emphasis was placed on Kamala as picking her because of her complexion, if you will. You know, her background of a Jamaican father, which made her qualify as a black uh, mother, from East Asia, I guess, uh, as Indian. And therefore, are they going to have to find somebody black, at least as a vice president? And would Kamala accept being vice president again? You can see the quandary facing the Democratic Party. And you can see why Biden and Jill have an argument. This is a major mess. Well, they think of it as a mess. We who truly believe in democracy know that democracy is messy. A brokered convention is, yes, not pure democracy because it's a matter of delegates voting, not all the people who voted in the primaries. But the Democratic Party was cheated out of a primary. There was no primary. The Republicans at least had primaries. They might have had debate, but they had primaries in various states. Jeff, let me, uh, I will look at videos on YouTube from time to time, and there's different people, and you can certainly criticize them. But I want to bring up, this is uh, people on YouTube, different political uh, analysts, will go through the states and be posting about how they see the election going in November based upon what the polling is in individual states, showing who's ahead and who's not. Now, obviously, these are a number of these states are very close. Some, like Virginia, are tied. Other states are only it's a one or two point difference. So, let's just take for for the sake of discussion here. We have this map that's showing that Trump, if the election were held today, would have 338 uh, electoral votes, and so you only need 270. That's a margin of 68 votes that he would have if this map were the final result, which means that while it's showing Trump and these lighter red are, you know, not as strong for Trump as, as others, uh, but if you have 68, that means that he could lose uh, Trump, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, and North Carolina and still be winning the election. So uh, it certainly is problematic as we look at that at this time for Joe Biden. And to your point, when you get these leaders of the party like Pelosi, like Barack Obama speaking behind the scenes, obviously this is going to be on their minds. And of course, as we have said before, and let's take a quick look at some of these these uh, states in blue are where the Democrats have Senate seats uh, up and it's going to be problematic for them if they have at the top of the ticket a Joe Biden who, you know, four years ago, it was the basement uh, campaign, but you could get away with that because of COVID. It's very difficult for them to have him 
uh, be hiding in the White House or hiding in the basement without COVID going on now. And what we increasingly see is he doesn't have the energy or the intellectual capacity any longer to be doing the job. I think, you know, you can spin it. The White House can try to spin this, but the American people are seeing what they're seeing, and that's what they saw in the shock uh, last Thursday night. Well, I would just say, Terry, to be perhaps, in my view, a bit more objective, just 10 days ago, we were talking about the Fox News power rankings. And at that time, and I don't think the situation has changed much since, they viewed it as Trump ahead 251 electoral votes to 241 for Biden. It's obviously gotten worse from the fallout, which, and so that could be closer to what you said. In any case, at that time, there was a toss up of 46 vote, 46 electoral votes that would decide things. And those states were Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, and Wisconsin. And almost surely, at least through the next few weeks, what we're going to be looking at are those, those four states I've just mentioned, and also Georgia, Minnesota, North Carolina. When you, those, those are the seven or so really swing battleground states and how they've moved or not moved in light of what was revealed by Biden in his debate will, I think, very much influence those power brokers that you've just been talking about as to whether they we did. I don't, I don't remember if you mentioned Pennsylvania. Pen if, if Biden yeah, does not get Pennsylvania, he loses the election. Yeah. There. I mean, you got up, you got 19 uh, electoral college votes there. Maybe, maybe maybe I didn't say the key toss-up states. When I said 251 to 241, the four states that were left out of that that were going to be determinative. The key toss-up states: Pennsylvania, 19 electoral votes; Arizona, 11 electoral votes; Nevada, six electoral votes; Wisconsin, 10 electoral votes. Then you go to the that are, um, are still important, but not as key as the four, those four. And I would say Georgia, 16 electoral votes, Minnesota, 10 electoral votes, um, and North Carolina, 16. And by so the I way, I, I think the last time any Republican carried Minnesota, I may be wrong on this, but it was like 1984? Quite some time ago, uh, right. So, so the, the fact, fact that that's in play, the fact that Virginia is in play, uh, Again, we're just trying to set this up. This isn't cheerleading, but we're giving you the lay of the land and what does it look like relative to what's going to happen in November. At this point, I would say it's Trump's election to lose, and the Democrats, if they keep Joe Biden on the ticket, are going to be hard-pressed. Well, let me just quickly just remind people we can come back. We talked about VP before. We can just sketch it out right now. My list, my list of the top VP choices, the short list that Trump either has or should have. Number one, Glenn Youngkin, 57 years old, two years governor of Virginia. Number two, Marco Rubio, 53 years old, 14 years as a senator. Key, he's Hispanic and he comes from the key state of Florida. Number three, J.D. Vance, 39. Well, he's said to be for various reasons thought to be helpful to ever, to buy, to Trump running as president in the states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Number four, uh, Doug Burgum, who I wouldn't put in there, but for some reason, Trump seems to have a liking. 67 years old, a bit older than you'd like, uh, two-term governor of North Dakota. Uh, number five, Tim Scott, now bring bring him back to the fore. 58 years old, important. I hate to be too racial about this, but he's black. The black the black vote is going to be, as we've talked about before, very influential, very important here. So, and Tim Scott, 11 years as a senator, he's a very good campaigner. He's in there. Okay, Last, you got it. Uh, then we're going to have to wrap up here. Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley. Nikki again, Haley's not going to be a, on the ticket because she's a female. Uh, okay. Folks, if tell us who you would like to see as Trump's first. vice president and any other comment you want to make. And, Jeff, until next time, we'll see you, folks. Have a great Fourth of July.